Thank you all for coming. I am Laura Crossett. I am the Adult Services Coordinator at the Coralville Public Library. And we're here tonight to celebrate banned books. The famous cases of books banned in the past are big and glamorous. Books burned like witches at the stake, cases of the Tropic of Capricorn or Ulysses or Lady Chatterley's lover seized before they could reach the bookshelves. They involve money and trade, the actions of governments, the stopping of presses and ships. The most famous fictional portrayals of censorship similarly happen on large scale. The buildings dedicated to the rewriting of history in George Orwell's 1984, the whole departments dedicated to eradicating books in Fahrenheit 451. But in fact, most book challenges happen in a much smaller place though I'd argue it's one that's no less important. They happen in a space most of us spent years in, that most of us pay tax dollars for, that most of us claim to support as the underpinnings of our democracy. Most book challenges happen in schools. They happen because some parent somewhere objects to the book their son or daughter has been assigned to read, or the book that's just on the shelf at the school library. They object because the book has a religious viewpoint, or they think it is too violent. They are offended by its political persuasion, or they are against it for acknowledging homosexuality. They think it's satanic, or they think it's badly written. They go through the book to read it not for content or character, but to count how many curse words it uses. Whatever it is, they object, and they object not only to their own child reading the book, but also to any child in the school being opposed to it. And the sad thing is, sometimes the school goes along. Sometimes they take the book off the shelf, or they remove it from the recommended reading list. But even if they don't, there's a chilling effect. Every challenge that happens means the next time a teacher wants to assign a controversial book, or a librarian wants to buy one, they may second guess themselves. Is this gonna get us into trouble? And it's that chilling effect more than anything that Banned Books Week is meant to fight. It's meant to remind us that literature isn't about sex scenes or swear words. And, I believe, it's meant to remind us that, as Supreme Court Justice Abe Fortas wrote in Tinker v. Des Moines, students and teachers do not shed their constitutional rights to freedom of speech or expression at the schoolhouse gate. Tonight, we're welcoming Larry Baker, whose novel, The Flamingo Rising, was the subject of one such challenge at an Illinois high school in 2010. As it so happens, just a year before that challenge, the school itself was involved in censorship. In 2009, the school administration stopped the presses on an issue of the high school newspaper, saying that an article about honor students smoking and drinking and another about teen pregnancy were, quote, not fit for print. <clears throat> a Chicago Tribune or editorial supported the newspaper staff, and most of the staff later resigned in protest. I'm gonna shut up now about democracy and education and high school students' rights and turn the evening over to Larry for your promised entertainment. But while we focus on sex tonight, remember that it's not just sex that gets taken away if you take a book off the shelf. It's Larry's whole book, which begins, this is a story about land and love and a great fire that consumed all my father's dreams. It's a story about growing up, which we all must do. Thank you, and please help me in welcoming Larry Baker. I've been practicing that Johnny Carson entrance for years. <laughs> Thank you, Laura, very much. Thank um, all of y'all for being here. Um, the more I talk, the more you will realize I am not from Iowa. Um, Thank the city of Coralville, the Coralville Center for the Performing Arts, and all those people involved in that, Eric, Kelly, everyone. Um, I'm gonna do two things tonight. I'm going to um, try to increase the temperature of the room by having one of you in this audience read sexually explicit lines. Um, it's interesting, I was listening to Laura talk about this high school, 
Um, and I realized in Iowa City, does anybody remember when Iowa City, City High used to have a weekly column or a monthly column called Crack Whore of the Month? <laughs> true story. Absolutely true. I, I, I stole that idea from another book of mine. Obviously, we in this area live in a different world. Um, and so I'm fortunate in that respect. Laura also gave you the opening line. Let me refine that opening line of this book. My name is Abraham Isaac Lee, and I am my father's son. And this is a story about land and love and a great fire that consumed all my father's dreams. That's the opening chapter. It's called Abraham's Voice. And so I'm going to quickly give you what happens up until the point of the section that I'm going to read. Abraham is a boy who, along with his sister, born on the same date, are raised by incredibly insane southern parents. I have no idea where I got that idea. <laughs> but they are raised and they live inside the screen tower of the world's largest drive-in movie theater. And it sits on the beach facing the ocean, a screen as big as this stage, and bigger in fact. Um, and their father, who's a little bit off, doesn't allow them to go to school. He doesn't allow them to have TV. Their world exists in terms of movies and Life magazine, which comes once a week. And that's fine for 12 or so years until the state discovers that they're there and forces the parents to make a decision to send them to school. And that's where things begin to fall apart. The father compromises and says, oh, well, if we got to go to school, we're going to send them to Catholic school. At least that's a little bit cloistered. Ah, but when they get to Catholic school, Abraham meets a young girl named Grace, and he falls in love. And that is the grace that you will hear about tonight. Uh, it's not a very subtle choice of names for a person who represents total goodness. And in the end, a sort of a form of redemption. The other characters you need to know about. There's Louise, his sister. There is a dog named Frank. Frank the dog, who is so insane that they put him in the room above Abraham. And he lives sort of cloistered in this space right above where Abraham goes to sleep every night. The mother, the father, the... Um, there's a pilot named Judge Harry Lester who, who does nothing right except fly. Um, and there's a black projectionist named Pete. They live happily. And then they meet the daughter, or Abraham meets the daughter of the man who operates the funeral home literally across the street from the drive-in. The funeral home, the drive-in. Death and Hollywood. Um, the fathers don't like each other. That's the feud. And when I start to read tonight, it's going to be the summer of 1968. And what's happened is that Abraham has suffered through the fact that in the summer of 1967, his father in this giant fireworks display on the 4th of July manages to set the funeral home on fire. The home where Grace and her brothers live, just like he lives with his sister in this giant screen tower. And her father, Turner West, has not allowed her to see him for a year. He is absolutely sick with love. And then he meets the new crew of 1968. So I want to set that up. And, and for those of you who have read the book, you're not going to recognize these names because one of the things I've done is for this reading tonight, I've changed the names of the two female characters just to confuse you. You won't know it. If you've never read the book, you won't know the difference. But if you haven't read the book, I don't want to give away who these real characters are. You'll have to sort of figure them out after you, of course, buy this out of print book over here. Uh, cheap at twice the price, $15, we take cash or check. All right, signed. And when I die, those books are gonna be very valuable. <laughs> Consider this an investment for your own children. Okay, so Abraham comes home one day and he's going to meet two 
girls, Lori and Sally, not their real names. Oh, one other warning. At the end of this particular short section, I'm going to pause and I'm going to ask for a volunteer. So I want to see some hands up, even though you don't know what you're volunteering for. This chapter is called, I Meet Lori and Sally. On the first day of March, Louise was sick and stayed home from school. And when I got home that afternoon, she had made a miraculous recovery. You've got to meet her, she said when I walked into the kitchen. Her? I asked, trying to be indifferent. Oh, Abe, are you going to go through your whole life being so blessed, calm? She was almost giddy. Just put those useless books down and go to the concession stand. Now, what follows is based upon a real experience in my life. My first look inside the concession stand turned me into a pillar of salt. Sally Russell. Sally Russell was bent over the edge of the popcorn popper, popcorn popper tray, cleaning out the salt and grease left over from a pre-opening test pop. I had to lean on the crowd control railing that led to the cash register. She was wearing short jean cutoffs and a white sleeveless cotton blouse. And the blouse was soaked with sweat, and I could see her bra strip strap clearly. Better yet, the bottom of the blouse was tied up high around the edge of her rib cage, leaving a field of unprotected flesh between ribs and hips, a field of tanned and perfect flesh. And as she scrubbed the inside of the tray, the lower half of her body swayed in the opposite direction, proving for me that the basic laws of physics that I'd been learning at St. Joseph were indeed true. You gotta think about that. I was 15. I was trying to remember Grace's name. Sally Russell then stood up straight and began the process of sucking the air out of my body. Her back must have been aching from leaning over so much, so she stretched her arms out and rolled her shoulders, arching her back, and I stared at her bottom. Her shorts were too short. Pushing out at the bottom edges were two firm mounds, two swelling white ribbons of flesh that screamed in contrast to the tanned upper thighs. All this part of my story, remember the whole book is told from the point of view of a man in his 50s looking back. All this part of my story, I have never told Grace or my sons, but I remember these details. Remember them as you remember the same moment in your life. It doesn't matter if you're male or female. You remember the first time you fully understood how the war between your body and your soul would never be a fair fight. Her bottom pulled tight and then spread apart by a Levi's seam. Sally Russell did the most sensuous thing I have ever seen. And not knowing I was behind her, she simply began to wipe some of the grease off her hands. An innocent act. She started to scrub her hands on the back of her shorts, her fingers seeming to massage the exact surface that I longed to touch. I wanted to be her fingers. I wanted my face to be her hands. My future daughter-in-law. <laughs> yeah, this is what you remember. I had kissed Grace West. The, Turner, the funeral home director next door is called Turner West. That's a local joke. I had kissed Grace West less than a dozen times in my life up until then. Short kisses, soft, tender kisses that left me dizzy and breathless. If the phrase making love had ever meant anything before it became a hackneyed euphemism, it was what I felt about Grace West. I wanted to make love to her, to achieve that platonic union of homesick halves at last reunited. I did not want to make love to Sally Russell nor did I desire her with the totality of my being. I had simply surrendered to that part of my being that had drained the blood out of my brain, blood rushing to another extremity of my body. I 
I will spare you the next few paragraphs in which this narrator describes her stomach. <laughs> Two paragraphs describing the curve of her stomach, the rise towards the middle, towards the navel, and that descent into the navel, this dark descent into madness. I will spare you all that. The reason I read this opening section is to give you a hint of a teenage boy with the hindsight of education, knowledge, experience, and language being able to finally describe this extraordinarily as he describes it. She, had the, she was a pornographer's dream. That's who he's going to have sex with. How does he know he's going to have sex with her? Because right in the middle of this chapter, he gets punched out of nowhere. Someone walks up to him and punches him. And her first words to him are, stare much, Romeo? And that's the other character. That's the Lori character. That's the mysterious character who, when he gets back to the, 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 the place where he lives with his sister, she says, oh my God, isn't she great? And he thinks his sister's talking about Sally. He says, no. You know, she's just a hug of the month. It's Lori. All the rumors about her. She slept with a priest. She was kicked out of Catholic school where we go. You know, she, she basically told the nuns that the Pope was fallible. She is pers somebody who is absolutely fascinating. And as he describes her, it's like, yes, she is. She has a control. She's 20 years old. She has a control over men and women. And she becomes sort of this mentor, cynical, smirky guide to his life. And she informs him very easily, very soon, that she has decided that Abraham needs to lose his virginity. And he needs to lose it to Sally. And she, Lori, is going to arrange it. She, Lori, is going to be in control of his life. And he tells, she tells him ahead of time, on his birthday, his 16th birthday. Which I understand, looking at this crowd, that's probably when you all lost your virginity on your 16th birthday. I'm looking at the young man in the front row here. And Whitney's looking at the young man in the front row. Okay. So... He is about a, has about a month to prepare for this. She's arranged it. She's the one in control. And she's having a good time pulling the string. So, at this point, I need a volunteer. I need a volunteer to be the voice of Lori. I need a volunteer. As I read the voice of Abraham, I need a volunteer to come up. I will show that person the script uh, and to read the lines that Lori's going to speak. So do I have any volunteers? Come here. You, you're, you're reading the book now, right? I am. I don't know if you've gotten to this part, yeah. this chapter started. here. But what I want, I'm going to show you some stuff here. Now, here's what I'll be reading, but let's just do this one passage here. Can you read that? Take a second and read it. You want me to read that? I'm, I'm, that would be I, the plan. Yeah. Yeah. You volunteered. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to pass on that. What is your name? Julie. Julie Peters? Yes. Oh, your husband is out running for Congress right now, right? Yes, he is. Oh, that's his excuse for not being here. It is. It is. It is. That's not good enough. He should be here. He, he could have been. He wanted to be he here. Would have got, he would have got these votes right here. Guaranteed. He wanted to be here. Chris Peters, <laughs> give the man a shot. But you don't, you can't read this. I'm Here's the thing, if he doesn't win, there'll be some karma involved. 
Thank you very much. Okay, that went well. Um, I'm not even going to ask for volunteers. No, I'm not asking for volunteers anymore. I'm picking somebody. I'm going to make it extraordinarily hard. Laura, get up here. Your boss? Yeah. And this matters to me? <laughs> no, come here. You're reading the book now too, right? Yeah, I am. I am. I finished it. Oh, so you know what's going to happen. But I'm going to refresh your memory. Okay. That's nothing, right? Okay. <laughs> really? Yeah, really. Hand it over. I, I sense a lack of enthusiasm. <laughs> I, I, I have a question for you. You set the thing, whole thing up, so you're sort of partially responsible. And I ask you to provide a separate microphone. Why do you have two separate microphones? You never know, Larry. You never know. Oh, God, the story of my life. Okay. Is, does this one work? Yep, they all work. Move over there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the thing. I'm pushing 70. L little things make me happy, right? I'm just happy. I'm happy to have an audience. I appreciate that. I'm happy to, sh to make somebody else a little bit nervous. But here's the thing. I have complete faith that this young woman is going to come through. And we're being filmed? Yes. For posterity. <laughs> Um, this is, what is your title? Adult Services Coordinator. Well, right there, you're the Adult <laughs> Services Coordinator. Yes. Kind of like Lori. Okay. So, uh, appropriately, this chapter is called To Forget God. Abe goes to Catholic school. Abe is raised by a very devout Catholic mother and a sort of a cynical, showy, agnostic father. And he's torn between the absolutely atheist guy across the street, the funeral director who has the girl, the daughter that he's in love with named Grace, and his parents. And this whole book is a struggle of where is he gonna finally fall in in those three options, faith, agnosticism, or total atheism. The day before my birthday had also been the last day of school, uh, June the 6th. It's a private joke involving the birthday of somebody very special. There was no air conditioning at St. Joseph, and I had been sweating all day. Before lunch, Louise had made some snide comment about my having a guilty conscience even before I sinned. Evidently, his sister knows about this. I asked her what she meant, but she gave me one of those looks that she had adopted from Lori, a look of smirk and sympathy. And I kept asking her what she meant until she finally told me to go ask Alice. I mean, sorry, to go ask Sally. <laughs> For the rest of the day, Whenever I saw Louise get anywhere near Grace, I took a deep breath and practiced my look of incredulity, which I knew would be required if Grace ever asked me about something that Louise may have told her. The truth is, I avoided Grace that day. I purposefully sat with Gary, his best friend, Gary, and some other boys at lunch, and in class, I was especially attentive during all the reviews of our final exam results. I was a model student. I knew what was going to happen the next day. Lori had not been subtle. And Sally seemed, I thought, to be giving me looks that I imagined had been the same looks that Aztec priests gave their virgin sacrifices right before they were laid on the altar. Louise had been right. I was feeling guilty. It was the last day of school, and I did not know when and how Grace and I would see each other that summer. It might be days or weeks. I should never have left her alone that last day in school, but I did. I wanted to suspend our relationship, certainly not end it. I wanted to pretend that I had never met her just for one day. I was damnable, and I knew it. 
When the bell rang at 3.30, a cheer went up in class. Louise and her two best friends immediately peeled off their blouses, Catholic uniforms, blouses and skirts to reveal their summer wardrobe underneath, shorts and halter tops. Sister Mary Frances was not pleased. I expected my mother to be waiting outside to drive us home, but when we were cleaning out our lockers, Louise told Grace and me that we were supposed to go to the booksmith to wait for Lori. Plans had changed. The booksmith is a bookstore downtown where Lori works. Why didn't you tell me sooner, I asked Louise. I thought Lori told you. She shoved her notebooks and uniforms into the same bag. Lori had driven us to school that day. It had been very much a silent trip with her looking in the rearview mirror back at me and Grace. And as we walked to the booksmith, Grace did not make me feel any less guilty. And even though Louise was behind us, Grace reached over and held my hand as we walked. Of all the hands I've ever touched, hers are still the softest. When we got to the front door of the booksmith, Louise handed me her bag and said, tell Lori I'll be back in an hour. I'm going to go buy myself a birthday present. Louise and Abraham have the same birthday. But you're supposed to stay with us. That's the rule. I knew it was a rule seldom enforced. Yeah, right, Louise said, and then she walked off. Lori was alone inside the booksmith, so I knew she would be busy with stocking or waiting on customers, and she couldn't get too far away from the cash register. Hey, it's my two favorite Christians. She said it as soon as she saw us. You got big plans for tomorrow, Is? She pulled old magazines off the shelves, innocently fanning her face with the latest issue of Playboy. You and your sister having a big party? You're only 16 once. I don't think so, I said. You know that we have a new picture opening tomorrow night and Louise and I have to work it. And, and you know, Louise, she doesn't like parties. Well, not quite right, Is. Your sister likes parties. She just doesn't like to share the guest of honor spotlight. She told me that when she moves away from home, she's going to tell everybody that her birthday is in January. Lori motioned to Grace to help her carry magazines. Grace had not said a word since we entered the booksmith. That was not too surprising. She was usually quiet when she was around Louise or Lori. Long silences were not unusual, but on this particular day, I began to wish that she would at least speak once. I was thinking that she might have been angry about my cold shoulder behavior all day. I can tell you all this because I understand it better now. But even back then, I was beginning to understand why I was so troubled. It was more than the knowledge that my birthday was probably going to be the day I lost my virginity. I sat in the corner of the booksmith and thought about the two females at the magazine rack. I was in love with Grace. But Lori was more real to me. I was in love with Grace, but Lori was more interesting to me. I was happy with Grace, calm and happy, but I did not spend time wondering about her, wondering who she really was. I did not think she was hiding anything, nor did I think there was more than one of her, like I did of Lori. So I thought that day at the booksmith, was I really in love? I'd assumed, assumed it for the past four years, had even felt it, had talked about it with Lori and my mother, but on the eve of my 16th birthday, I was looking for a sign of some sort, some moment between Grace and me that would tell me that I was right about us. I knew that proof of love was not possible. But on that last day of my 15th year, I was beginning to lose faith in love. I wanted that faith back. Eventually the moment came, but I had to wait until my mother's funeral. An hour later, as Lori was driving Grace and Louise and me back to the Flamingo, the Flamingo drive-in, and as Grace and I sat in the back seat, I asked myself if I could change the next day. If I knew for sure, and I thought I did, that Sally was coming for me, would I stop her? 
I looked at Grace's face as she was looking out the window. I looked at Lori and Louise singing in the front seat. I looked in the rearview mirror and saw Lori looking at me. I closed my eyes and pretended to be asleep until we got to the West Funeral Home. Will you call me tomorrow? Grace asked me as she got out of the car. I, I want to wish you a happy birthday and I have a present for you. I'll come to see you. I told her that, but I could sense that Lori and Louise were trying to act like they were not there, as if they were embarrassed. It was behavior I did not expect from them, but I did appreciate it. I'll come see you. I repeated again and again, and then I added, I want to come see you, I really do. Back at the Flamingo, I kept getting the same question from everyone. Party tomorrow? Pete, the black projectionist. Pete asked, and then the judge asked, big plans for tomorrow? Even my father seemed curious. Have you heard anything about a party? By the time the box office opened, a party seemed inevitable. When Sally asked me if I had plans for tomorrow, I was beginning to smell a conspiracy. Business that night was disappointingly slow, but it was not surprising because the whole week had been slow. Gary and I had the lot speakers turned off soon after the intermission and the few cars that stayed for the second feature, two for the road, that will date most of you in this audience, two for the road, kept their own volume during, turned down low. Gary and I sat on the patio trying to figure out why my father's, figure out my father's booking logic. You think he just takes the cheapest second feature he could get? Gary wondered out loud. Figures that people only care about the main show? Maybe, I said. But I think he looked that he booked this one because he likes Audrey Hepburn. Did you notice how much time he spent on the patio this last week? Most of it during the second show? That's true. Gary was slowly seen, his feet propped up on the patio chair in front of him. And she is pretty. I remembered how many times in the past few years that we had played Breakfast at Tiffany's as a second feature. Years later, after my father bought his first television set and then a VCR, he and I would sit and watch a video of Robin and Marion. Check it out. Robin and Marion, it has the greatest explanation for what love is. Over and over, Sean Connery, was an old Robin Hood. Hepburn was an old Maid Marian. By over and over, I mean more than once a month. My father would cry at the end, and you will too. He was very predictable, just like he had been in 1968 when Laurie had Pete play that Bobby Goldsboro song over the big speaker horn on top of the tower the day after my birthday. My father and I had stopped had stood on the lot, and I had seen him get misty-eyed as Goldsboro sang about trees and a dead girl. See the tree, how big it's grown, but friend, it hadn't been that long. It wasn't there. And honey, I love you, and I'm being good. That's not in the book. I just thought I'd sing that. <laughs> Song is honey, again. Half the crowd, honey, huh? The other half, oh yeah. Goldsboro sang about trees and a dead girl. My mother had gone into the projection booth, jerked the record off the turntable, and instructed Pete and Lori that if she ever had to listen to that song again, she would personally make a living Hades for whoever was responsible. Something else you need to know if you don't, haven't read the book yet. This is the first person, narra first person narration. There's no profanity in the book. That's why high school teachers sort of like the book. He can't say bad words. He, he makes up different words for them. The concession stand closed early, the night before my birthday, and Sally disappeared as soon as the cleaning was done. Gary waited at the gate for the film delivery truck so he could carry the new film cans to the booth for Pete to set up. The judge came by the patio and informed me that he was going to bed early that night. Seems like nobody was inclined to sneak through the exit gates to see this particular movie. And so by midnight, I was alone on the patio. Penny, for your thoughts? 
Lori was behind me, leaning forward and pinching my shoulder as I watched Audrey Hepburn and Albert Finney drive through the French countryside. I did not turn around. Lori, do you have to sneak up on me like that? Is a herd of elephants could have sneaked up on you just now. A herd of fudging three-legged elephants. I was watching the movie. I like this movie. Yeah, sure, you and your daddy. I was silent, but Lori did not go away. I have a message for you, Is, from Sally. Lori... <sighs> as soon as the field is clear and everybody is tucked into bed, she wants you to meet her down on the beach where they always go swimming. Bring your swimsuit if you want, but you probably won't need it if you know what I mean. It was all beginning. A hot night is. A swim in the ocean is just what you need. And Sally has a present for you. Lori, why are you doing this? I mean, tell me why. Five minutes past midnight, Isaac. Your birthday has just begun. There was a half hour left in the movie and it would take another half hour for the field to be cleared and the flamingo to be closed. Lights out, gates locked, all the Lees, Hubert Lee and Abraham Isaac Lee, all the Lees and employees in bed. I had an hour left until I would meet Sally on the beach. Even if promised eternal life and the adoration of the masses, I could not tell you what I did in that next hour. Those 60 minutes are a void in my memory now, a daze of expectation and transition, the missing last page of a chapter, perhaps not missing, more accurately, erased. I found myself walking on the beach at two in the morning. A full moon would have been nice, but the moon was almost totally dark, a tiny sliver. I could not see the horizon, but I could smell the ocean, and I could feel the warm breeze, and every sense of my body was working overtime to absorb the outside world. I could see the two red lights at the top of the Flamingo Tower, and I could see the yellow light at the end of Pete's caboose. Pete lives in a caboose. I could see tiny white dots far out on the ocean, probably shrimper lights. Those were all I could see. I was wearing my bathing suit and my Hawaiian shirt. My feet were bare, and I could feel the hard sand. And then I could feel the sand getting moister the closer I came to the edge of the water. I walked away from the flamingo and then back toward it, back and forth, back and forth, waiting for Sally to meet me. Just when I thought I'd been tricked by Lori, I heard a voice. Over here. I stopped walking, listened. Over here. I did not recognize the voice. Over here is. The voice was Lori's, and I was disappointed. And in the distance, I could see a form move toward me. I've been watching you walk up and down the beach. So she finally stood in front of me. You seemed lost. I, I didn't see you, but but my voice gave me away. You weren't looking for me. I thought you said Sally was, and then she stepped closer, less than an arm's length away from me. I thought you said Sally was going to meet me. I didn't need an answer to know that Sally was not anywhere near me at that moment. Lori's first touch was soft her hand slowly moving up my arm. She was wearing perfume, something she had never done before as long as I had known her. I closed my eyes and saw Lori's face as it, had looked, as it had looked in the rear view mirror in the car as we drove home one day. My last words for a long time were, why, Lori, I don't understand. Shh, and just listen to me. She bent down and very slowly kissed me. Just listen to me. She was kissing me as she talked, her lips warm, wet, 
magnetic. Blood was being arranged in my body, leaving my head and searching for those undiscovered pools of pleasure. I was dizzy and I was absolutely terrified. I had forgotten Sally, forgotten Grace, forgotten Abraham Isaac Lee. I had forgotten God. I was on a blanket on a beach and an ocean was rolling toward me. I was on my back and Lori was sitting on my legs, pinning me down, moving her hands over my rigid flesh, and she still had her dress on. Listen to me, Isaac. Listen to me. And she started to tell me what was about to happen. It will be over very quickly for you. And you will be ashamed and you will think you have done something wrong. But you must not move. You must just lay there and let me move for you. And much, much sooner than you could ever imagine, you will be ready again, and we will go very slowly. Her dress floated around her, and then she moved up over the center of my body and guided me to the center of her body. She descended and I was inside her. That is the sensation. That is the mystery revealed. Not the culmination, the loss of control, the climax. Every boy can induce his own release, an easy manipulation of self-love. But as soon as Lori settled herself around me, I crossed over into another world. My body did as she told me it would. I emptied myself in a quick convulsion, almost biting my own lip in an effort to stop. Lori was leaning forward, her hands squeezing my hands, pushing them into the blanket. That was a start. But we're not through yet. We were motionless for a few minutes, but neither did we separate. I stayed inside her, and then she began to slowly move the center of the universe. A new life was formed, and with that, Lori pulled her dress off her shoulders, but not off her body. I reached up and touched her breast, and she put her hands over mine, not letting me free, and in my palms, I could feel the flesh at the tips of her breast swell and grow rigid, and she leaned farther down, and the firm tips of those breasts moved across my chest and then up to find the tip of my tongue and then the circle of my own lips. Taste, touch, and smell swirled around me, and then a whispered hum vibrated down from her throat to the center where we were joined, flowed there, and then up my stomach and through my heart to the farthest edge of my memory. Don't move. I want to show you something. I could see nothing. With the center of her body slowly rising and falling, Lori began to kiss me. This is what you will learn from me. And her lips began tracing mine. Everything should begin and end with this. An hour and a world later. I was still lying on my back on Lori's blanket looking up at a dark and starry sky. Lori was lying beside me. I was naked. She had fully, she was fully covered by her dress. I did not know it then, but I was never, ever, ever going to see her body. You okay? I asked her. She rolled over onto one side, planted an elbow, and propped her head on her hand. That's a strange question. I just wondered if you're okay, you know, I, I, if, if all this was okay for you. I'm fine, Abraham, absolutely fine. And it was very sweet of you to ask. Nobody else ever has. We did not speak again for a long time. I think I fell asleep, but I'm not sure about that. I do remember Laura nudging, Lori nudging me in the side after a while. You need to get back home. The sun will be coming up soon, and you need your rest. Today's the big day. 
Your parents are giving you a party. I could see a faint line of purple and orange on the horizon. The tide was coming in. You know, I said as I pulled on my bathing suit and buttoned my shirt, I really believed it when you said Sally was going to do it with me today, that you had a present, that she had a present for me. You're very good at telling lies. Lori had been walking away from me as I spoke, but she quickly turned. Is, I never lie, much, but I wasn't lying about Sally. You are going to do it with her today. We have been planning this for a long time. She wants to be your first, so don't disappoint her. Let her believe that, and everybody else, too. I could not speak at first. I finally said, you mean I am, I'm going to have sex with Sally today? But, but Lori, aren't we going to do this? I began to say, but I knew the answer even before she answered. Only once, Isaac. You can only do it the first time, once. Lori. Oh, Iz, relax. You'll live. You'll be fine. I taught you the most important part, and you were a quick learner. But Sally will teach you all the foreign languages, all the Latin and French and anything else you've ever dreamed about. You'll bop like bunnies every chance you get, and you will see a lot of her body up close and personal. It's okay. Enjoy her body. Lord knows she does. Then this didn't matter to you all that we did? Is that what you think? I was almost stuttering. I, I, I don't know what to think. I was your first is, but I won't be your last. If you're very, very lucky, Grace will be the last one. The beginning and the end. That's all that matters. So this was just the beginning and everything between you and Grace, all that won't matter? Nothing matters, Isaac. Nothing at all. Eventually, not even me. Before the sun came up, I was back in my room. There was no school, and I could sleep late. As I closed my eyes, I listened for Frank to walk over me. I was very tired. And that's the end of the chapter. Thank you very much. Um, I go to the main podium. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, Thank you. I think Larry will entertain questions from the audience if there are any. Or I will entertain the audience. I don't. It, it's. Um, let me very quickly tell you. Well, I'm not going to tell you what happens after this. You've got to read the book. Um, I will tell you this. Hallmark, most of you know, made a movie out of this book. 2001. William Hurt, Elizabeth McGovern were the two stars. Uh, the only reason to watch that movie is because of Elizabeth McGovern. Uh, I could not have imagined that an actress could actually be the mother that I wrote about. And she is, she was brilliant in that role. And, and more so, I met her on set, and it's, it, I was astonished, she speaks with a British accent. In the movie, she's as Southern as can be. Perfect. The rest of the movie, however, you are forbidden by law to watch until you have read the book. But for this reason, and, and I had a conversation with the president of Hallmark, um, I said, I don't understand your script here. Here's what they did. They eliminated Frank the dog because he's very clear. We don't do to dogs in Hallmark movies what you did to Frank in your book. Okay. <laughs> Not going to give that away. Let's just say Frank the dog is based on a real dog named Frank the dog who is actually buried in Iowa City. I can give you the, the people whose yard he's buried in don't know he's buried there. <laughs> The other thing is they said, we don't do sex on the beach. I'm shocked. Hallmark doesn't do sex on the beach. But how did they solve that problem? In their version of the story, the kids get up to the age of 12. None of this teenage stuff. The story stopped. Everything else in the book except sex on the beach stays the same. 12 years old, no sex, no nothing. The problem with that is, if you eliminate that, then you've eliminated 
the need for the two characters I talked about here, Sally and, and Lori. There's no point for them being in the movie, but they threw these actresses in there. It's just an absolutely confusing mess. Um, but as, as a friend of mine who's in, an actor uh, pointed out to me, he said, Larry, did you cash the check? I said, well, of course. He said, then shut the hell up. It ain't your story anymore. So, um, Hallmark solved this problem by not having teenagers at all in the story. So, um, any particular questions or comments or, um, yes ma'am? Um, can you tell us the story of the school that she had, the book? Oh, um, I had not heard about this until I think it was Jeff Carlson at the press citizen called me and said, well, what do you think about being banned? I thought, boy, that's great. Uh, and, you know, this is, a, this is a, a glib joke from every writer in, a, in the world. Please ban my book. Unless, of course, you're in a society where they ban the book and kill the writer. <laughs> but you can live with a, your book being banned. I thought, oh, this is great. The problem was, this was years after it came out, 2010, I believe. The book was basically out of print by then. And it wasn't being pushed, and it, was, it didn't really generate a lot of sales. But I immediately called the high school and tried to find out what was going on. And I got through to a teacher. I says, what's going on? He says, well, we had a parent do this. And it, 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 it's, we didn't really require them to read the book. It was on the list for like our advanced students and everything. But one of those parents obviously could not imagine their child dealing with SEX. Um, and if you, if you listen, that's not, that was like a nice, no body parts, well, no body parts. Um, um, I tried to write not what they did, but how it felt. And that's what I was trying to do. Um, and, the, and the teacher said, well, you know, we'll, we'll leave it in the library. I thought, well, that's nice. We'll leave it in the library. And I volunteered to come over to the school, you know, three-hour drive. I said, oh, why don't we do this? You don't, they don't have to read it. Why don't I come over and you can talk about, you know, why the book was banned, what's the writer thing, let the kids have this great discussion. And the teacher said, I don't think the school board will let us do that. And I kept thinking, Iowa City, crack horror of the month. <laughs> Illinois, don't even let the writer show up. Um, and, and now this is a book, it was, it's, it's taught on a regular basis. Julie, your son, I think, was one of the classes um, at, at West High School. Every semester I go to West High School and talk about the book. And it's very interesting because the, the kids, the sex, big deal. You know what bugs them? The dog. The dog is very upset. The dog bugs them. What, what happened to the dog? The other thing that bugs them, and I never realized this until I had actually gotten teenagers to read the book, and especially teenage girls, they are so mad at Abraham for, for having sex with Lori when he was in love with Grace. And, you know, male, you know, we're, we're stupid. We don't understand these things. We're, oh, of course. But that was the point. Body and soul, body and soul. Um, but boy, teenage girls are very judgmental. <laughs> If you have some in your family or they're growing up, they're, very, they're different than boys. Yes, ma'am. Teenage girls are never judged by the world at large. Mm -mm. No. What is that? I'm going to tell them a Bobby Goldsboro story if you don't, if you're supposed to support me. See the tree, how big it's grown. Her brother wrote that song. Oh, she's going, oh, God. Um, so um, it's interesting. Jeff did an editorial about it uh, last year. The Moline Library, or the Rock Island Library invited me to, you know, I could take this show on the road, I guess, once a year. they like, dig me up, dust me off. Hey, Larry. Um, but it is a very ironic, one, because I, I know a lot of books where I understand how traumatic or how adult they are or how 
or the issues that they raise or the language that they use. Sure, I, I understand that. Uh, I understand why Huckleberry Finn is banned. Absolutely brilliant book, but I understand it. I got this one. I, said, I don't understand this one at all. Sex on the beach. And as much as I dramatized this and advertised it and made it like a big deal, folks, this is, I was going to say G-rated, but it's basically PG-13 rated. I used to be in the theater business. Um, or was it politics? It's the same thing. Uh, but I'm dumb. There's a drum roll. Kelly's in the back there saying, oh, God, yeah. Politics, that's like show business. That's like, yeah, theater business. Um, I'm rambling here. Another question. Oh, this is interesting because um, I will tell you now, and this is not public knowledge yet, I'm, I'm back in the movie business in a different way. If you follow me on Facebook, and I'm, if you're one of my 4,888 close personal friends on Facebook, <laughs> I don't, she, I embarrass her, but she still continues to go out in public with me. I don't understand it. Uh, if, if, I'm a big fan of Harry Chapin. Um, I'm more than a big fan. I, um, I idolize the man. Um, I, I have uh, written a screenplay, a music biography of Harry Chapin's life. Um, and the Harry Chapin family has read it and likes it a lot. And we are now in the process of seeking out producers. And one of the things I'm doing is I'm contacting people I had contact with for Flamingo uh, and getting a pretty good response so far. Uh, it's a very strange um, creation because I take a man's life, a musician's life, and I don't use the facts of his life. I take all of the songs that he wrote and the characters in his songs, and those become the characters in this life. He lives and knows all of these characters in his songs growing up, and it's a way to introduce the music. And, you know, we've got Bruce Springsteen in there, and Michael Moore, and Robert Redford, and all these people who knew Harry. I take this concept, and then I go around, and I'm now talking to the same producers. The woman, for example, who, when Flamingo first came out, HBO, the, here's the big difference. I had an agent when the first book came out, a um, wonderful man who I didn't get along with, but a wonderful man, uh, and a film agent who, uh, every other word was MF. Your mother, I'm so goddamn, made me cry, I've got to the end of this, but my God, you son of a bitch, I killed him, oh my God, you motherfucker. That's because I'm a role model for my son. Um, she wanted to do Flamingo for HBO. Uh, she was doing at the time uh, A Lesson Before Dying. I don't know if you remember that movie on HBO or not. Um, I forget the writer's name. She's involved in that, she got that production. She had 18 months, big option. Remember, when any time a writer says, oh man, I optioned off my movie, it, it means whatever figure they quote, you get 10%, and then if it never gets made, that's all. They had 18 months, and what I discovered was that Hallmark discovered the movie, discovered the book, after HBO optioned it. Like a month afterwards. They waited 17 months. They literally, and this was interesting because as the date approached to, they had 18 months to start production. They weren't doing it. They couldn't get it together. Three days, two days, one day before it's over with, the producer's calling me, HBO's calling me, give us some more time, give us some more time, da-da-da-da-da-da. My agent over saying, don't you dare. I said, why? She said, just don't do it. Don't talk to those people. They had 18 months, screw them. Man, man, man. That's Asian talk. The day after the option lapsed, the Asian call said, Hallmark bought your book. They've been waiting 17 months to buy your book. I said, were they gonna offer as much money? He said, no, but you know what? The difference is they will pay you 100% even if they never make the movie. A week later, I get a check for the, 
And what I discovered is that Hallmark buys a property. They've got so many books bought up that will never be made, but they own the rights to. Um, and that's just a matter of the book being noticed ahead of time. Um, agents, you know, the way to sell a book, two ways to sell a book. Some way generate hype before it's published. You, you read all these deals about movie rights sold and then the book is published because somehow they hyped it up. Or it's published and it's a bestseller. And then you can, but if you don't do one of those two things, it's almost impossible to option off a movie. Do it ahead of time or generate sales to prove that there's an audience for it somewhere. So I waited and uh, I had a script and Hallmark never knew and um, interesting story. The, uh, I watched the movie and I thought, I'm going to die. I'm just going to keel over and die. I don't care about cash in the check. Every writer in the world has a, cannot help to have a territorial proprietary interest, not in the book, but in the story and the characters. And they didn't do it. They just didn't capture it at all. And not only that, from a film standpoint, and this is for, you know, this is a craft version, there's all sorts of problems with the movie. Continuity, names change, things you don't, you know, people are staring into the camera who are supposed to be in the background. I thought, this is not a well-made movie, period. My name is on it. The script writer is Richard Russo. A wonderful writer, wonderful human being, wonderful man. A year after the movie is out, he's in Iowa City on tour. Just he had just won the Pulitzer. We sit down for a drink, and he says, "I, I just want to apologize to you." <laughs> I said, "What?" He said, "Here's the thing. That movie had nothing to do with your book or my script." I wrote a script, sold it, Hallmark bought it. I was obligated to do two rewrites. I did them. And then they hired the director who called me and said, this is a great start and never talked to me again. They sent him a copy of the, uh, the movie, a video, a week before it was to air. He said, Larry, I plugged it in, watched about an hour of it, pulled it out, called Hallmark and asked them to take my name off the credits, and they wouldn't do it. He said, it was just awful, and I'm embarrassed for both of us. Now, that being said, people, some people like the movie. I think it's because they never read the book. Um, so, you know, I, I'm working on a different, completely different kind of, kind of project. Uh, and it's, you know, the Harry Chapin thing. Um, I'd love to get Nancy Adams, this last book I published, uh, somebody interested in it because it's perfect to film in Iowa City. If you, uh, two high schools. In fact, the book is full of pictures of Weston City High. Um, what I would really like, and this will drive Kelly crazy, I'd really like for somebody to option my second book, Athens, America. See, here's, here's the separation. People groan, they know what that book's about. Other people, well, what the hell is going on? It's okay, it's okay, but let's put it this way. I'd love to do that script. Um, any other questions? I'm, I'm, I'm getting this subtle signal from my wife. <laughs> uh, okay, it, it, was, it was subtle. Oh, I'm sorry. It's 10 after 8. I forgot about what. You're just going to sleep by 9. Okay. <laughs> Any last comment or question? And, and like I say, seriously, if anybody would like a copy of the book, we will. You know what I have in my pocket? I have $100 worth of $5 bills, which means it's perfect change for a 20 <laughs> for a $15 book. What? Didn't I tell you I used to be in the theater business? That scene in, in, in Flamingo, the dead woman on the toilet, true story. I picked a dead woman up and put her over my shoulder and carried her back to her car. 
And as I'm doing that, I'm saying to myself, this is a great story. This is a great story. <laughs> the, the funeral home catching on fire. Absolutely, I did that with my fireworks. And the, the fireworks were so explosive. They went up, they were so bad, they went up 30 feet, fell down on the funeral home next to my drive-in theater, set it on fire. They're wheeling out caskets to keep them burning up. And it falls into a, the big box of fireworks in front of the, blows up, destroys my box office, knocks me unconscious. I wake up, the funeral home was on fire, and the funeral director is like, um, true story. This, you steal this stuff from life. <laughs> you, you all so got those stories. This is a work of nonfiction. So what? This is autobiographical work, is what you're telling us. Oh, the, the flamingo? Yeah. Um, well, my wife has a problem with that. <laughs> because if you've read the book, you know what happens to the wife in the, in the book. Um, so, yeah, the dead woman, the, the selling sex education books car door to car door. And, and showing a movie called The Birth of Triplets on the biggest screen in America as the, from the doctor's point of view, as bang, 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 little bambinos are popping out right and left, and all of a sudden, what comes after the birth pops out, and I got 800 pregnant women on the field, 200 men who are puking everywhere, and the pregnant women are, hey, hey, all right, all right. And then they show the circumcision of the little boy baby, those guys who had just recovered from the birth, wake up, look up, oh, pass out again. That's all true. And the trick is, you know, to turn it into fiction. Um, I, I thank you again very much. I don't want to take up too much of your time. Thank you. Laura, thank you very much too. And uh, there, there's, there's booze over there because I know that it's been a rough night. And, Feel free to, to do whatever you wish. Thank you. Yeah.